So, uh, Fintan Buckley is my name. I'm uh, the CEO of Yobotica. We're um, a computer vision and artificial intelligence uh, company providing solutions on the edge. So, what I'm going to talk to uh, today is actually the deployment of solutions that use AI. So, I'm actually uh, you know, coming at this from the totally opposite end that Nick is coming at, where he's talking about you know, AI as, as technology. I'm looking at AI as something, a commodity that you use in an application. So we're gonna look at, you know, three different uh, use cases, one biomedical, one is uh, warehousing logistics, and, and then the third is, is to look at what we're doing uh, in the space arena with uh, ESA. Okay, ourselves. Um, we're focusing on a number of different spaces. Uh, all of our work is based using the Intel Movidius uh, myriad family of devices. Uh, we have uh, just over 10 engineers now um, and growing, and we are split between Dublin and in Ciudad Real, which is just south of Madrid. Uh, just to briefly what the myriad BPU is, it's a Vision processing unit, it's essentially, it's a multiprocessor device. Uh, it has, uh, in the Myriad 2 device, 12 uh, custom processors or shaves and two uh, Leon processors, which is entity is the uh, microprocessor of choice in space applications as well. Myriad X, um, uh, sorry, the other aspect of, of the, the Myriad architecture, it has uh, inbuilt, uh, image filtering uh, on, on the fly. Myriad X is a next generation device which has more shaves, um, uh, inbuilt support for running neural networks and uh, more filters. And I think Michael who's coming after me is gonna talk uh, much more about using uh, the functionality of the Myriad in anger. Okay, so on, on the biomedical side, um, we, we have implemented a, a prototype for uh, tackling a disease called diabetic retinopathy. It is actually the leading cause of vision loss in uh, adults. Uh, you can see the figure there for the UK back in 2011, uh, over 57 million pounds cost in, in actually testing and, and actually treating people with this disease. Uh, it's, it's, it's such an issue that there are national screening programs in, uh, in Ireland and in the UK. Scotland, I think, uh, is one of the more advanced screening programs um, and in certain other geographies throughout the world. It doesn't get much attention because it's only people with diabetes who actually suffer from this. Okay? So the footprint of diabetic retinopathy is, is actually quite evident to, to the naked eye. So what we're looking at here is, is uh, images of the retina, which is the, the back of the, uh, the eyeball. And um, you can see on, on the left hand, sorry, on the right hand side there, uh, some of the footprints of, um, of uh, this disease. There was a Kaggle challenge run on this a number of years ago. And what we did is we, we took um, the database and uh, the network architecture that, uh, that actually won that challenge and we retargeted at the Mary device, made some uh, enhancements, uh, particularly on the image preprocessing, um, and achieved a precision, a overall accuracy of just less than 80%. Okay, we're running this uh, on a bog standard uh, PC and using, even though the picture there shows some custom hardware, it, it's actually just running on the Mary device. Um, so this should just run. So, so this is just uh, running inference on, on some of these images. It's actually slowed down so you can see it. Um, so your inference rate is about 20, uh, uh, 20 to 50 milliseconds per image, okay? DeepMind, Google DeepMind, have uh, just announced a cloud-based uh, product which uh, addresses this particular issue. And uh, our solution that we're proposing is, is, is a little different because we, we are uh, providing an approach where it can all be done on the edge. So what we're talking about is initially being able to uh, interface with uh, the specialist cameras that take the images um, and actually doing the inference in, in the office uh, of the uh, 
uh, the ophthalmist who takes the images, and ultimately to actually integrating the mirror device into the camera itself. We see this potentially as, as a beachhead into tackling other uh, uh, diseases associated with the retina, including glaucoma and hypertension. And uh, interestingly enough, there's also research been done in diseases such as uh, Alzheimer's. The retina is unique because it's the only non-invasive way you can actually see blood vessels of the human body. And this is why there is such a focus from uh, companies such as DeepMind uh, to actually uh, being able to use this as a, as a method of actually diagnosing human diseases. Okay, that's the first one. Uh, the second application, uh, totally different, it's uh, doing uh, freight management within a warehouse. So uh, this is a program that we're doing in uh, conjunction with Lenovo and with Intel, and was uh, announced, uh, formally launched this year in uh, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. So the business case that's being addressed here is um, I've been able to, to manage goods received and shipped out of the warehouse. The, the current business model is that the, the goods are received um, and stored in a, in a, a customer-owned area of, of the warehouse, and then they are transferred uh, into uh, the ownership of Lenovo. And this requires the, the handling of the goods on multiple uh, multiple times uh, through the operation, where the goods are unloaded from the truck into a staging area, transferred into uh, an area where they're still owned by, uh, by the supplier, then involved a, a, a relabeling and a removement, physical movement of, 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 the, of the, the product into uh, an area of the warehouse where the data or the product is owned by Lenovo themselves. Okay, so the the solution is, uh, that, that's being delivered here has been able to actually take the, the, the product as it comes off the truck and actually do all of the back end management of, of the product in terms of transferring ownership, et cetera, whilst the, de the goods are being moved from the truck into the storage area in the warehouse. Okay, so just kind of uh, capturing that. So the Data will, will come off the truck, and it's pre-labeled using uh, data matrix code, which are uh, equivalent to QR codes, just a little bigger. And as they transition uh, through the warehouse, the codes are read uh, using these overhead cameras. The content of the fork is decoded. Uh, a back-end SAP system is used to determine where in the warehouse the data is stored. That information is provided uh, to the forklift driver, who then um, meanders his way through the uh, warehouse. There's cameras on the forklift truck itself that determine the location uh, of where the fork is. And when it reaches the destination, uh, the load is deposited. Okay, um, we also use computer vision to actually detect the, the unload events so that uh, the backend system can be updated to say, that the pro where the product has been uh, deposited. And obviously there's a reverse when, when the product is shipped out again, exactly the same technology. Okay, so we're doing this using uh, the uh, Intel Movidius uh, Compute Stick, which is essentially uh, a, a Myriad device, either Myriad 2 or the Myriad X on, on a USB stick. We're replacing uh, RFID technology, which uh, is actually quite troublesome and, and actually quite expensive when you start to look at the volumes that, that these uh, warehouses are using. Okay, so a little bit about the architecture. So uh, the kind of pinky area is, is the technology that we're implementing. Um, and we, we basically, it's, it, it, it's a traditional system in, in terms of, uh, from an IT perspective. Where, where we're managing uh, data uh, to, to figure out you know, what, what's, the, what, what's the product that's removed, where is it in the warehouse. But instead of transferring uh, video data uh, around the, the, uh, the system, we're actually just tra transferring the results of the, the inferences that we're running on the edge. OK, 
Okay, we have two major parts to this. Uh, we have a, it's a, a virtual gate where we have multiple cameras which, which are decoding the identification of the forklift itself and also the contents uh, that are on the fork. The real reason why AI is using this and why it's possible is that it takes approximately 28 seconds to decode a frame to figure out where these data matrix codes are and what they actually represent. By applying artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm, we actually decrease that to less than uh, 50 milliseconds. And that makes it usable. These forklifts are moving at 25 uh, to 30 kilometers an hour. You don't have much time to actually capture images of them and to decode and, and to get the data back to the, the back end to figure out where it's going to go. So, so you need uh, this sort of processing speed to be able to, uh, to actually make the system work at all. Okay, so this is uh, the system actually running uh, with just two ca cameras, uh, one on either side of the virtual gate. And you can see what we're doing is we're, we're detecting uh, the data matrix codes. Another element of this that we have to do is, is actually figure out um, exactly what content is on the fork. We've got to be able to figure out, are we not decoding content or are we missing it? Okay. On the forklift side, we, we have two cameras here. All right? So this is the, uh, the edge piece of it. We're using exactly the same um, models for doing location detection. Um, the front-end camera is, is a purely uh, computer vision operation to figure out uh, when a load is on the fork, and that's what triggers the actions. We're using a very lightweight um, edge uh, communication protocol, MQTT, to actually transfer very, very small amounts of data around the place. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very, uh, uh, I guess, light system. It's easy to manage, very little data. Okay, so, so this is the, the other aspect of fork in, uh, in operation. So on the top left, we get a load detect. Okay, um, eventually we will uh, deposit this, and you'll see then on the right the uh, decode operation looking for where the, uh, the fork, the load has been uh, deposited. You see that happening right now. So now on the right, we're actually doing the location detection. You know, these, these videos aren't quite synced up. Okay. So in summary, from, from a, uh, a machine learning type, uh, perspective, to actually implement this, we ended up using uh, or generating uh, 3,500 labeled images. So it took a bit of time to actually sit down and actually draw boxes to, to identify data matrix codes on, on the images. It took about eight days in total. We have augmented data of approximately uh, 430,000 images, which were, were uh, generating synthetic data to compensate for noise, particularly for the fork-mounted camera, uh, rotation, for size, and orientation um, of, of the data matrix codes. We, we have a total of about five gigabytes of data that we use for training now. Okay? Our training uh, equipment was uh, actually not that performant. And in fact, uh, as uh, you know, we went through a number of training cycles. Uh, the, the latter training cycles, we were just using regular P PCs with maybe one GPU on it. Um, and the total time, training time, in, uh, over uh, a number of sessions was about three weeks in total. OK, so in summary on this, the you know, the, the, the AI element of this allows the system to work. If we couldn't do the AI, couldn't do the, uh, the, low, the uh, data matrix decodes in, in the time uh, of 50 milliseconds or whatever, um, this system wouldn't work, okay? The cameras are generating a lot of data. What we're doing is we're eliminating the need to actually store that data by actually just detecting the information we need and discarding the images, okay? Okay, so finally, uh, on, on the space aspect, and some of this will, will cover a bit of what uh, uh, was discussed earlier, okay? And uh, when we talk about AI in space, we're, we're very much focused on Earth observation. So this is, this is data that's been generated by satellites that are looking at 
the Earth itself, okay? Or these satellites are generating huge amounts of data, more data than, than, than can be processed, okay? The drive for using uh, artificial intelligence has been able to extract information from this data at source. Number of reasons for that. As we say there, the downlink uh, the, uh, uh, to get the data down is, is slow and it's expensive, and you can only do it when the satellite can actually see uh, uh, it get into communication with the, um, with the station on the ground, okay? Um, the, the other aspect of this, it, it's the time it takes, okay? Not only for the time to, to download the data, but actually to process the data and to figure out what's in this data. Uh, one example we talk about all the time is fire detection. So right now, from the time that, that a satellite will, will detect or will capture an image of, of fire on the earth, it takes approximately three hours to get the data down and get it processed to, uh, to actually be able to make decisions about what to do about this. By, by doing this decision making, this, this detecting and decision making in the satellite at source, you can actually be, uh, use this data in a, in a much more effective manner. So for fires, we've been able to get alerts down to earth much quicker to be able to take a corrective action, okay? Okay, um, the other aspect about using AI as opposed to uh, traditional uh, technology on the satellites is that you can repurpose your, your AI technology depending on where the satellite is. So for example, if it's over water, you can be using it to run um, algorithms you know, for, uh, for marine type applications such as plastic detection, ship detection. And when you're over earth you can, or land, you can be using it for agricultural applications, fire detection or whatever. The other thing uh, about uh, you know, why you want to do AI is that it's about volumes of data. The NGA is, a, is an organization in the state. It's the, the National, uh, National Geo something Intelligence Agency, Geospatial Intelligence Agency, okay? They estimate that they would need 60 million people to process the data that's been provided to them. So clearly that's not gonna happen. It can't happen, and this is why we need to be using techniques to uh, to figure out what's in the data at source. Okay, um, this is uh, one example of, uh, of, of an application that you can do from space it's in terms of uh, detecting ships at sea. Uh, applications here are piracy, smuggling, uh, refugee um, detections. Two minutes, okay, right, okay, I've got to hurry. Okay, uh, one thing we need to think about is when we talk about imaging from space, you're not talking specifically about images that the human eye can, can detect. Uh, what's much more important to us is hyperspectral imaging, where we're looking at multiple uh, uh, wave bands across the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And we can use this to do chemical analysis, I guess, of, of, of Earth in terms of looking, for example, of nitrates, hyd uh, hydration of Earth, etc. Okay, we also use this for fire detection. So here's um, you know, uh, examples of where we can actually uh, use this in any useful manner. Okay, another good example, which is uh, uh, from a, a commercial point of view, is, is a company did a study uh, and was able to correlate the amount of cars parked in the car park of a JC Penney's in the States and the stock price of uh, JC Penney's. Okay, so being able to actually predict the stock price based on, on the number of cars gives someone an advantage in terms of making money in the stock market. Um, one of the issues about doing earth observation is uh, cloud. So if uh, in, I'm sure Scotland is the same as Ireland, um, if there's too much cloud, then the data you're sending down is useful. So we're working on a program right now with the, uh, with the University of Pisa in our, in, to be able to do cloud detection and to be able to determine only the usable parts of the image and only transmit that down to Earth using an AI application. Okay, so this is essentially what you're doing is uh, you start with the original image, you mask out the, uh, the cloud areas and just transmit the, uh, the, the useful part of the image to, to Earth. Okay. Some metrics, I'm not gonna get on two minutes, but I'll be close, okay. Um, so, in 
Next year, 2000, uh, 2020, there will be a, a lunar landing uh, mission. It will land on the moon, and it will have some AI intelligence in it using uh, the uh, configuration on the left-hand side. Okay? This year, we will be launching uh, a, a CubeSat into space uh, using the Myriad 2, uh, which is a fraction of the size, fraction of the cost, fraction of the power consumption. Okay, it's estimated in terms of a, a metric, um, in terms of megapixels per second, per kilos, per weight, per euro. This is the level of performance that, that, that you're, you're, in, you're achieving here. Okay, uh, just briefly, so, so this um, board up in the top is, is actually the board that's going to fly uh, in the CubeSats this year. It was actually developed um, uh, as part of a 2020 program, uh, which... Um, uh, Movidius were involved in, uh, University in Spain was involved in, the Ciudad Real. Um, you can see it, it's small, it's essentially, it's got, it's got the, the Myriad in the center, it's got a uh, flash, it's got SD card and, uh, and whatever. And this is a general purpose board. It wasn't specifically designed for space applications. And the only thing that's been done here is, is putting on some latch-up protection on the, on the board for this mission. These CubeSats, um, it's what, uh, it's what it's going to go into this year. It'll get launched uh, from French Guyana in August of this year. The interesting thing to us is that this is essentially a disposable satellite. The mission will run for about 12 weeks, and then it's just thrown away. Okay? Uh, this is the, uh, the technology, the, uh, uh, the uh, image capturing technology that, that's uh, on the satellite. Uh, it's a hyperscale. It uh, comes from a company called Cosine. Um, you see the applications there on the, on the, uh, the right-hand side. Um, Hyperscout 2, we will be looking at, um, which is uh, the one we'll be doing in August, which is uh, introducing the AI technology into it. Okay, this is uh, uh, output of the cloud detection uh, algorithm that will run on the, uh, on the Hyperscout, uh, about 150 milliseconds per inference. Uh, this is some of the results that we're, that we're seeing. Okay, uh, getting close to the end. Um, part of this activity was, was to do some radiation testing on the Mary device, which uh, we did in CERN in uh, November of last year. We just completed a second session in, um, in Germany, actually last Monday, uh, to, to making assessments on, on how we think the device is going to perform in space. Uh, some interesting results out of it, uh, which are, uh, I think, of surprising even some of the experts on this, particularly around the performance of the onboard DRAM in, in the Mary device. Okay, um, so kind of an idea of the cost that you're dealing with here. Um, so the CubeSat mission will cost about 60,000. Sentinel-2 uh, will cost about 35 million. Okay, so in summary, this is a, a new area in, in terms of uh, applying AI uh, in, uh, in orbit applications. The Myriad is going to be the first uh, AI accelerator that's going to be used uh, in, uh, in, in any space application, and it's going to happen this year. Okay. Okay, thanks, Fintan. I think we'll skip the, the questions. <laughs> yeah.